We've all heard about hot saunas. We've all seen our favorite pro athletes plunge into an ice bath or step into a liquid nitrogen cryotherapy pod. I've tried all of these, dug into the science, and collaborated with some of the best athletes and physiologists to get to the bottom of all of this. Which ones are legit? Which ones aren't? In this episode, we'll be talking about two main topics. One, we'll be talking about the use and misuse of ice baths, cryotherapy, and hot sauna. And two, we'll be talking about how to best incorporate movement and stretching throughout the entire work day. Those will be the two main topics, but before we go into that discussion, I wanna flag a couple news items. Earlier this month, the Wall Street Journal published an op-ed with the headline, the fasting cure is no fad. And it really made my day. Four years ago, when I first started fasting with folks at the HVMN team and our community, people thought we were crazy. Now the tide has really turned where even the most basic of mainstream media are calling fasting not a fad and actually a cure. And it's honestly just heartening to see all these people improve their physique, lose weight, look better than ever, be healthier than ever, and even folks on the pre-diabetic, diabetic side of the house, increase and improve their hemoglobin A1C levels, improve the blood sugar levels, and actually reduce and almost get off of insulin. So thank you and credit to all of you HVMN community members for changing eating culture and really changing the world for better. I believe that a similar paradigm shift will happen around the ketogenic diet. As important as fasting is, eating properly is as important as well and the food pyramid is already being flipped on its head as we all know. Just as clear to me that fasting is here to stay, it's clear to me that we'll be reducing the consumption of refined carbohydrate, and therefore one of the ways that people get enough calories is eating healthier fats and potentially calories from ketones directly, like from our ketone ester. Now let's talk about the two main topics. And first we'll be talking about cryotherapy, ice baths, and saunas. As you've probably seen on ESPN or behind the scenes TV and footage of pro athletes, you see these men and women kill themselves with a super hard workout and then immediately plunge themselves into a bathtub full of ice water or they jump into a futuristic looking cryotherapy pod. But is that stress really worth the effort? Is this the right thing to do? Of course, folks who've been following my personal journey know that I'm very positive on hot saunas. I regularly dip into the steam room for as long as I can after I do a workout. The evidence is strong and Dr. Rhonda Patrick has a great deep dive on this literature around hot sauna. I wrote an article on some of the health benefits of the sauna and I had predicted that I thought it would play a role in longevity based on some other evidence. And then this study came out showing indeed that it there is a link between um, sauna use and a decrease in all-cause mortality. So people dying from cancer, from cardiovascular disease, from a variety of different diseases. So now we have hot and we have cold, and people say both are great for a lot of the same benefits like recovery. How do they actually work and how do we best apply these techniques? This is actually not super well understood because the various protocols apply hot and cold for different types of bouts whether that's for training or for competition, isn't well studied in academia. Therefore, best practices must come from a combination of combining the existing scientific evidence, hypothesizing the best theoretical ways to combine the mechanisms at work behind the different exercise and recovery protocols, and ultimately relying on in-field, hands-on experience with professionals. My goal here is not to do a scientific literature review of all the studies around ice baths and hot saunas, but really to reference the key studies and collate all of that against my experience working alongside some of the best performers and physiologists in the world to provide you a simple framework that you can apply to your own training and recovery. But before we do that, let's take one step back. Why do we exercise and how does exercise actually work in making you strong? Complicated question, but we'll make it simple here. Exercise acutely stresses cells, and that stress induces an adaptive response. And this adaptive response occurs both at the muscle level as well as the cellular level, where the cells themselves spawn more mitochondria and gain efficiency with metabolic substrate oxidation. However, too much stress 
turns into overreaching or overtraining, which leads to poor performance and eventually injury. In this overreaching type scenario, the stress overcomes the ability of the body to adapt to that level of stress. Now enters ice baths, cryotherapy, and hot saunas. These two types of interventions are in the discussion when relating to recovery. So with ice baths, the key study here to note is a 2015 Queensland study published in the Journal of Physiology. And this study found that ice baths actually attenuated long-term gains in muscle mass and strength. It blunted the activation of key proteins and satellite cells in skeletal muscles up to two days after strength workouts. Literally across the board in the study over a 12-week training period, the group using ice baths after workouts saw reduced muscle size gain, reduced strength gains, and reduced anabolic signals that exercise typically induces. Not very good news for ice baths. On the other hand, with a hot sauna, there's a classic 1976 study that showed that a 30 minute hot sauna session elevated serum growth hormones by a massive 142%, which has been replicated in other studies. And a second point around hot sauna that is important is a relatively recent 2019 German study showing that the cardiovascular response in a sauna is very similar to a moderate bout of aerobic exercise. So with these three specific papers and the infield practice and application and learnings with leading coaches and athletes, I can establish and present my simple framework for hot versus cold as follows. Heat on one side increases stress and therefore increases the adaptation responses. Cold on the other hand slows cellular processes and essentially blunts adaptation. Therefore, to maximize adaptation, one should use heat after a workout and not use cryo or ice. In fact, the cold basically halts a lot of the benefits of your hard training. However, ending a workout with a passive cardiovascular bout plus a dose of natural endogenous human growth hormone is about exactly what you want to maximize your gains. However, are there any edge cases here? Yes, potentially. In the case of an extreme scenario, when you're nearing overreaching, but still need to go out to compete the next day, then adaptation is less of a concern than getting out the next day with as much function as possible. This could be for a survival scenario or a long endurance type scenario. In this case, I might invert my protocol where I would avoid the heat because I'm not trying to adapt and increase stress. Rather, I'm trying to maximize and reduce as much stress as possible which could be helpful from cold. But honestly, given how mixed and weak the data behind cold is, I think it is marginal or placebo at best, and it backfires at worst. Equally hyped up is the hot sauna, but I see a lot more substance there. I have no dog in this race. I follow the data and punch through the hype. My conclusion here is that hot sauna is legit, cryotherapy and ice bath, not so much. The second topic I've been thinking a lot about is the incorporation of physical movement into the modern office lifestyle. We really need to change the paradigm of how we incorporate physical exercise and movement into daily life. In our ancestral hunter-gatherer days and during the agricultural revolution industrial eras, our ancestors made their livelihoods via physical labor. We foraged and hunted throughout our waking hours. We tended crops and herded animals for 14 hours a day. We worked on a factory line for 16 hours a day constantly on our feet. Physical exertion was constant and continuously integrated into our waking hours. But in our modern intellectual and creative economy, most of us don't make our living through our physicality anymore. We sit at home on the computer watching YouTube or Netflix, and then we sit in the office on the computer answering emails, and then we sit in a motor vehicle as we travel in between that home and office. Rinse and repeat five days a week. Tack this onto a crappy diet and we have a generation of humans that are probably the weakest and most chronically diseased in the history of our species. Now, we've tried to solve this by doing workouts and going to the gym. And these are decent ways we try to reinstall physical exercise back into our lifestyle to maintain optimal health. While this is much better than not doing anything at all, I wonder if this is ultimately the wrong paradigm. Physical exercise and movement shouldn't be considered an item off a checklist to be isolated for just one hour a day. This suspicion is recapitulated by a 2013 Maastricht study 
published in PLOS One, showing that one hour of daily physical exercise cannot compensate the negative effects of inactivity on insulin level and plasmid lipid levels if the rest of the day is spent sitting. So I've been experimenting with how to best incorporate movement into my entire day. Yes, I still do the 60 to 90 minute full body workouts at the gym. I do my running, I do my cycling, but I also supplement all of that with as much constant ambient activity while I'm in the office. I often take meetings on my feet. If I'm in the office, I'll stand for our presentations or stand and pace. If I can take the meeting outside, I'll often make it a walking meeting. Don't just sit down for a coffee, take a walking meeting with that coffee. I have a kettlebell next to my desk and I'll do some squats or swings or just carry it around for a minute or two in between emails or in between calls. I'm currently actually doing right now a 100 pull-ups a day challenge and I usually get 50 pull-ups in the morning at the gym and then space out the rest of the 50 pull-ups throughout the entire workday. I know I'm super lucky and fortunate that I'm in an environment where this is easy and acceptable, but that's why I'm talking about this today. It should be easy and acceptable for everyone. I know that we've changed culture around fasting, and I predict that we'll be also changing culture around constant continuous integration of movement into the modern office lifestyle too. Why shouldn't your desk have a kettlebell next to it? Why shouldn't your office have a pull-up barn in it? We've changed the world with fasting once, so you can change it again with the active integration of movement into the modern office lifestyle. And again, one of the key ways we're improving human nutrition at HVMN is to make calories from ketone esters and good sources of fat readily available. And in support of that mission, we just launched our MCT oil powder and our Keto Collagen Plus products. And the feedback has been astounding and amazing. I personally use both products every single day, the MCT vanilla in my morning coffee and the Keto Collagen Plus chocolate and vitamin D whole milk after my workouts. Go check those products out. We spent months and months refining and making those really, really the best in class. So check it out. It makes your keto lifestyle much easier and much yummier. What have been your experiences with the hot sauna, cryotherapy, or ice baths? Have you tried incorporating more movement into your day-to-day -day office lifestyle? Share your best tips below in the comments. If you find my ideas helpful, please share, subscribe, and put it out there. Thank you so much. Keep learning and keep self-experimenting. See you next time.